I'm reading The Desire of Ages in the morning for my devotional. And a few months back, um, the story was uh, The Touch of Faith. And it starts with the story of a Jewish ruler that had come to Jesus and asked for healing for his daughter. But the part that caught my interest was um, this part that comes next. And it says, on the way to the ruler's house, Jesus had met in the crowd a poor woman who for 12 years had suffered from a disease that made her life a burden. She had spent all her means upon physicians and remedies only to be pronounced incurable. But her hopes revived when she heard of the cures that Christ performed. She felt assured that if she could only go to him, she would be healed. In weakness and suffering, she came to the seaside where he was teaching and tried to press through the crowd, but in vain. Again, she followed him from the house of Levi Matthew, but was still unable to reach him. She had begun to despair when in making his way through the multitude, he came near where she was. And we know that wasn't a coincidence. The golden opportunity had come. She was in the presence of the great physician. But amid the confusion, she could not speak to him nor catch more than a passing glimpse of his figure. Fearful of losing her one chance of relief, she pressed forward, saying to herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. As he was passing, she reached forward and succeeded in barely touching the border of his garment. But in that moment, she knew that she was healed. In that one touch was concentrated the faith of her life, and instantly her pain and feebleness gave place to the vigor of perfect health. With a grateful heart, she then tried to withdraw from the crowd, but suddenly Jesus stopped and the people halted with him. He turned and looking about, asked in a voice distinctly heard above the confusion of the multitude, who touched me? The people answered this query with a look of amazement jostled upon all sides and rudely pressed hither and thither as he was, it seemed a strange inquiry. Peter, every ready to speak, said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Jesus answered, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. The Savior could distinguish the touch of faith from the casual contact of the careless throng. Such trust should not be passed without comment. He would speak to the humble woman words of comfort that would be to her a wellspring of joy, words that would be a blessing to his followers to the close of time. Looking toward the woman, Jesus insisted on knowing who had touched him. She came forward tremblingly and cast herself at his feet. With grateful tears, she told the story of her suffering and saw how she had found relief. Jesus gently said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace. He gave no opportunity for superstition to claim healing virtue for the mere act of touching his garments. It was not through the outward contact with him, but through the faith which took hold on his divine power that the cure was wrought. The wandering crowd that pressed close about Christ realized no accession of vital powder, power. But when the suffering woman put forth her hand to touch him, believing that she would be made whole, she felt the healing virtue. So in spiritual things, to talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living faith avails nothing. A nominal faith in Christ, which accepts him merely as the savior of the world, can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for entire knowledge before he will exercise faith cannot receive blessings from God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces him <clears throat> as a personal savior which appropriates his merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction 
by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation to God. A genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. After healing the woman, Jesus desired her to acknowledge the blessings she had received. The gifts which the gospel offers are not to be secured by stealth or enjoyed in secret. So the Lord calls upon us for confession of his goodness. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. And I want to repeat that last statement. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we be reveal in ourselves the working that it, of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. When the ten lepers came to Jesus for healing, he bade them go and show themselves to the priest. On the way they were cleansed, but only one of them returned to give him glory. The others went their way, forgetting him who had made them whole. How, my, how many are still doing the same thing? The Lord works continually to benefit mankind. He is ever imparting his bounties. He raises up the sick from beds of languishing. He delivers men from peril which they do not see. He commissions heavenly angels to save them from calamity, to guard them from the pestilence that walketh in darkness and the destruction that wasteth at noonday. But their hearts are unimpressed. He has given all the riches of heaven to redeem them, and yet they are unmindful of his great love. By their ingratitude, they close their heart against the grace of God. Like the heath in the desert, they know not when good cometh, and their souls inhabit the parched places of the wilderness. It is for our own benefit to keep every gift of God fresh in our memory. Thus, faith is strengthened to claim and to receive more and more. There is greater encouragement for us in the least blessing we ourselves receive from God than in all the accounts we can read of the faith and experience of others. The soul that responds to the grace of God shall be like a watered garden. His health shall spring forth speedily. His light shall rise in obscurity, and the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon him. Let us then remember the loving kindness of the Lord and the multitude of his tender mercies. Like the people of Israel, let us set up our stones of witness and inscribe upon them the precious story of what God has wrought for us. And as we review his dealings with us in our pilgrimage, let us, out of hearts melted with gratitude, declare, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and a call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. This chapter was, I read it when I had just started my cancer journey. And I asked God to help me to be grateful in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. I'm finding that an attitude of gratitude touches people. It will change their demeanor when you praise God. And we need to look for opportunities to praise the Lord to others, to tell them of God's goodness towards us. Friends, what is your story? <laughs>